looking forward american artist react to 20th century modernism curated by kate hill myself and tyler valera who are presenting this lecture today uh, this show is a combination of two exhibitions uh, the show opens with john taylor arms embracing gothic in the 20th century and is followed by the exhibition Restructuring of 20th Century Space. Both exhibitions reveal the reactions of American artists during the industrialization of the United States. The first show centers on John Taylor Arms, an American artist who clings to the familiarity and comfort of the past. He produced prints of Gothic cathedrals from his travels throughout Europe and emphasized the need to return to the glorious religious past of the Gothic period. The second show features five artists who take a different approach to the growing modernization of America. We dubbed these artists the embracing artist due to their collective interest in the urbanization of the social, social fabric of America. These artists include Don Kingman, Reginald Marsh, Joseph Pinnell, Frederick Whitaker, and Maria Wiki. Their works consist of various media, such as watercolors, pastels, etchings, lithographs, and color screen prints. Scenes focused on New York City, East Coast shipyards, new industrial technology, small town buildings, and the glory of American landscape. The curators, Kate and myself, conceived of these exhibitions as two separate entities, which would have hung side by side in the study cabinets at the SU Art Museum to allow for an immersive experience. The hoped for placement of the exhibitions would have allowed for visitor interactions with the display, opening and closing the study cabinets to create new juxtapositions of the works from both shows. Following the spring semester COVID-19 shutdown last year, we reevaluated how we would like the exhibition of, of our shows to go up. Through discussions, Kate and I realized the common threads of anxiety, frustration, fascination, and the exploration of modern material and technique in both of these exhibitions. The industrial boom of the 20th century forced artists like those in these shows to reconcile their newfound reality and artistic identity. For this reason, we decided to combine these seemingly at odds approaches to modern technology into a single exhibition. Just as art the artists come uh, came head to head with new artistic practices and standards, Kate and I tackled the daunting task of creating a compelling exhibition for the virtual world amid global crises. We wanted to try to replicate our initial concept, seeing the works from both shows simultaneously in order to illustrate the interesting divide between the artists looking back and those looking forward. For you all today, we have taken works from each show paired them together to discuss the visual themes of both exhibitions. Our first pairing is between John Taylor Arms's Chartres and Maria Wicke's Buildings at Lewisburg, PA. This first pairing lays the groundwork for the material in our exhibitions, discussing artistic motivations, materials and techniques, and subject matter. First, we have John Taylor Arms's Chartres from 1924. The subject matter of this print is typical for Arms's body of work. John Taylor Arms was born in 1887 at the pinnacle of industrial production in the 19th century United States. Arms originally studied architecture at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the 1910s, but would later become a renowned etcher and writer for his prints and drawings in the 20th century. His most beloved subjects were the architecture and landscape of European Gothic cathedrals, as we can see in Chartres. Although he did focus on other uh, modern subject matter, Arms returned to the facades of medieval cathedrals uh, constantly throughout his printmaking career. In Chartres, Arms elevates the cathedral above the quaint townscape so that the symbol of religious prestige and dignity, the church, overlooks the people of the town. Arms spares no detail in articulating the forms of the houses and structures of Chartres 
and the flourishing flora of the area. Through his composition, Arms crafts a visual hierarchy of society within which Christianity reigns supreme. The cathedral is an ever-present force that dominates the life and culture of Arms's ideal perception of Western modern society. The details of the cathedral and the town mark this separation of power and authority. Where the cathedral is soaring, clean and polished and almost weightless, the town buildings are squat, dirtied and in need of structure and organization. As we will continue to see, Arms's work carries subliminal messaging on the need for religious guidance and the referral to higher powers in the modern era. Arms's emphasis on Gothic structures and the glory of historical art forms is directly contrasted with the work in restructuring of 20th century space. In Maria Wiki's Buildings at Lewisburg, PA from 1941, we can see the embrace of vibrant color, fluid line, and cropped compositions. Wiki's watercolor painting is small in scale, an intimate study in architectural structures and unique vantage points. The fluidity of Wiki's brushstrokes is in contrast with the rigidity of Arms's linear printmaking. Her fields of color and line are not stiff, but full of bumps and subtlety of movement. Her pops of red, greens, and blues live in her landscape, and her use of negative space allows a reprieve from the condensed form of the buildings. Maria Wiki is one of the artists in our embracing artists category, a category of um, those interested in modern subject matter, materials, techniques, and ideology. Wiki's buildings embrace the modern construction and building types of 20th century America. Her emphasis on quaint small town steeples and functional structures embodies the foundation of American secular centers. Moreover, buildings at Lewisburg, PA suggests the increasing secularization in the United States, such secularization that arms was, was vehemently against. There is a possible church or steeple structure at the center of Wiki's composition, but gone is the pressuring presence of religion over state. Wiki's steeple is not overtly a reference to Christianity, as the same architectural component was commonly used on government and public buildings throughout the 20th century. Her buildings do not try to dominate one another through hierarchy. Any height disparity seems to stem from the happenstance of the forms rather than from religious messaging. In all, John Taylor Arms's work encourages the resurrection of traditional religious values from a European and Gothic perspective, while Maria Wiki provides an American, secular, and forward-thinking modernity. In our second pairing, The Gothic Spirit by John Taylor Arms and Tugboat in New York Harbor by Reginald Marsh illustrate the different emblems of medieval and modern eras. In The Gothic Spirit, an etching by Arms printed in 1922, the stoic creature leans towards the viewer, meeting eye to eye. It's pronounced nose, high brow, softly sculpted mouth, and amiable expression gesture to the creature's careful observation. Gargoyles were initially used in Europe as architectural features used to channel water away from the stone, effectively minimizing the erosion of brick and mortar structures. Over time, the features evolved and became more anthropomorphic with animal, human, or monstrous characteristics. Many of the gargoyles on the buildings, churches, and cathedrals that arms etched are modern reimaginations of the medieval gargoyle. This explains why the gargoyle and the Gothic spirit has such a kind and inquisitive look. It is also worth noting the incredible depth of detail and precision that the gargoyle is etched with. Arms would not have been able to get so close to the gargoyle because of their height, usually placed above doors or on the sides of buildings where the walls meet the roof. Arms's gargoyle suggests his preoccupation with the material culture of a medieval religious world, 
finding comfort in the static, unchanging cathedrals of Europe. The undulating, curving lines of the gargoyle and his shadow reveal Arms's connection to modern sensibilities and the influences of impressionism, abstraction, and fluidity. No matter how much he wished to escape into the medieval past, Arms's artwork reflected his place in the innovative 20th century. Tugboat in New York Harbor, painted 20 years after Arms's Gothic spirit, illustrates the evolving attitudes and technologies present in American culture, industry, and art. The color screen print by Reginald Marsh displays the ambition and success of New York Harbor through new industrial technology. In the center, the enterprising ship painted in yellow and black is at the forefront of the composition, gliding through choppy waves of the port. The ship emits billowing black fumes from the smokestack on its journey home with its new fashionable imports. We, as viewers, can imagine the mercantile possibilities available to those in the United States through the wide marine trade network. Just as the boat confidently moves across the water, Marsh captures the United States drive forward, seeking new commercial relationships for the blossoming industrial market of New York City. The fluid marks of the water and the city skyline sit back behind the industrial tugboat as it moves swiftly through the composition. The form of a ship is a common emblem in art history to symbolize advancement. Even more poignantly so, in Marsh's print, the tugboat vibrates in a bold color with the tenacity and strength of the new sterling steel era. Tugboat in New York Harbor conveys the post-war American absorption into materialism and consumer-driven capitalism. In this second pairing, we get to see symbols of the eras that the artist embraced. For arms, this icon was the historiated and romanticized gargoyles of the 17th and 18th century that hark back to the development of medieval Europe. For artists embracing the turn of the century and advancing technology, the tugboat in New York Harbor by Marsh symbolize the expansion of commerce and New York City as a center of industry and advancement. These next few slides complicate the story that Kate and I are crafting. So far, we have seen John Taylor Arms rejecting modern materials, locations, and subject matter. But in Cobwebs from 1921, we see something else. This etching of the rising city streets suggests his other interests. Cobwebs depicts a wide street in 20th century New York City, with buildings pressed close together along the avenue. In the background of the composition, Arms emphasizes the taut cable lines of the Brooklyn Bridge, recalling the structure and elegance of a spider's web, which he evokes in the title, Cobwebs. This etching is one of the few prints that Arms made of the urbanized cities of the United States. The modern buildings, the paved avenue, and the expansive tension bridge seem at odds with Arms's architectural aesthetic. It is possible that Cobwebs represents his attempt to reconcile his love of romantic grandeur with the fast-paced urban centers in America. There is another possible motivation for creating cobwebs, albeit a little more dark. For all of Arms's lovely attention to detail, there is an odd emptiness to the street and buildings that would be normally bursting with life. This emptiness could be connected to Arms's contempt for modern city growth as a damaging force to humanity's passions and humility. Likewise, our embracing artists did not completely shun the visual traditions of the past. Frederick Whitaker's Roman Temple of Diana Nimes from 1959 is one of the few works in the restructuring of 20th century space that directly evokes a traditional architectural history. Whitaker's watercolor depicts the decaying and crumbling ruins of an ancient structure. We see blocks of gray stone carefully arranged to create a barrel vault passageway into a monumental place. 
the bright sunlight filters into the open foreground, framing a whimsical flock of pigeons, unbothered by the missing sections around them. Whitaker places emphasis on um, the open, nearly abandoned courtyard, forcing the viewers to recognize the passage of time. The remaining symbols of the inhabitants and of the local community have become lost to the modern viewer. Foliage from the left background overtakes the massive stone masonry of the dilapidated corridor and vaulting. Although here we see that Whitaker is attracted to the structures of the distant past, he is not in league with Arms's fascination with reviving an ancient religious society. Whitaker rejects the formal qualities and execution that Arms incorporates to his European subjects, revealing Whitaker's own devotion to modernity. In Arms's Cobwebs and Whitaker's Roman Temple of Diana, we can see a shared interest in draftsmanship and structure. Each artist has painstakingly attuned to the lines and motions of a given locality to capture the mood of the area. For arms, the loneliness of the city. For Whitaker, the serenity of antiquity. Our last pairing this afternoon is of John Taylor Arms' Gothic Glory and Joseph Pennell's Washington Square. These two works demonstrate the complicated relationship between past and present. Gothic glory sends cathedral, an etching done in 1929 by arms, encapsulates the grandeur of the Gothic past and the intricacies in which arms created his work. The minute details of the windows and facade draw the viewer into the space. The walls on either side of the composition narrow into the transept of Sens Cathedral in Burgundy, France. Based on some investigative Google mapping, it is unclear if the image by arms captures the north or south side of the cathedral. However, it is clear that arms is focusing on the towering facade and the delicate tracery of the rose window as a shorthand for the Gothic style. The truncated buildings flanking the street are withered from time and neglect. Arm selectively chooses to exclude any identifying details from the structures and instead focuses on their neptitude next to the grand cathedral. He changes the proportion of the buildings in relationship to the cathedral to diminish the impact of more recent construction. The unfocused and imprecise mark making of the flanking buildings are deliberate to emphasize the delicate forms of the Gothic facade. Washington Square, a pastel drawing done in 1917 by Joseph Pennell, illustrates the conjunction of past and present as they meet in the bustle of New York Center. Pennell's astute ability to draft composition mirrors that of arms. However, Pennell's approach to Washington Square is unlike the hierarchical and truncated forms seen in the previous arms etching. The open composition of Washington Square invites viewers into the foreground, joining the bustling figures moving about the middle and background. The organic forms and soft tones of pastel color tie together the rectilinear buildings and structures with the fluid gestures of the people and the trees. The proportions of the triumphal arch to its surroundings emphasize the vertical rise of the arch, giving Pennell's acceptance to the integration of past and present. The equal attention given to each component for the scene, the people, the arch, and the cityscape of the background give light to the convergence of the old and the modern. This verticality also implies a hopeful message on the continued rise of industrial ambition that will continue to aid and strengthen American identity. These two works seen in tandem show how the past can coexist with the present. Although Arms's Gothic glory focus on the historic Gothic cathedral, the structure still stands for us to explore and admire today. The same as of Pennell's Washington Square. And although the triumphal arch originates in Rome, the architectural structure is used throughout history to mark celebratory events and domination. This domination in Washington Square takes the form of modernity's triumph over traditional values 
and the integration into a new system of visual culture. We have shown a lot of 20th century artists today, all with varying subject matter, techniques, and ideological spatial relations. Our study is not a perfect reformulation of 20th century discussions on modernism, as there are numerous other media, materials, and subjects in order to discuss emerging artistic traditions in America. Today, we have only shown a snapshot into a specific vein of artists struggling to find their place in the industrial United States. We hope to convey with our exhibitions the complexities of modernism and how individual artists manifested their joy, triumph, despair, and hope through different visual traditions. The trials and tribulations of artists during the industrial era are similar to the artistic revolutions happening in our own time. We are in yet another cycle of reevaluation on the needs, forms, and dissemination of artistic expression. Artists now navigate the rise of cybernetic materials, the isolation brought about during the pandemic, and the reimagination of displays, exhibitions, and programming. It will be interesting to track future cycles of reimagining our spaces, landscapes, and technology in American art. Tyler and I wanted to thank you so much for coming to our lunchtime lecture today. We hope you've enjoyed the various works and our own interpretation of 20th century artists. We have invited you to explore the rest of our exhibition on the Syracuse University Art Museum website. We can share the link in the chat below. Do we have any questions from our audience? I'd like to just take an opportunity to thank Kate and Tyler for just another amazing presentation. Um, and mention, I forgot to mention earlier that if you missed an earlier presentation by this duo, um, they did an amazing uh, presentation on critters in our collection um, for a Halloween themed Orange Central talk, which we have posted on our YouTube um, museum account. So um, I encourage you to, to visit that as well to see some other presentations by them and also their peers that have been um, working with the museum collections and researching our holdings to give these wonderful virtual exhibits and presentations. Um, and I echo if you know I see some some thank yous and some wonderful presentations, but if anyone has any um, any questions, we're, we're here to answer them. Um, and if not, that's, that's fine as well. I'm sure they would love to just hear thank yous and wonderful presentations too. And like I mentioned, um, if you are on campus, which I recognize quite a number of the people who are attending today's presentation as Syracuse University community members that are currently here, um, we will be installing in our next iteration of exhibitions opening April 8th. It could be April 8th, it could be April 9th. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, a small selection of the works from their uh, virtual presentation in our um, in our permanent or our, our galleries here at the museum. So we're happy to be able to showcase it, not in the in the original intent that they wanted for the full show, unfortunately, with the study cabinets, um, but to give you a teaser of their their objects in person. Um, and I have a question from Sasha for you guys. Um, you talked a little bit about the shows being planned last year, but how did you choose these works or artists and objects to work with? Yeah, um, so both Kate and I, um, well, we last, oh, how long ago was it? Fall 2019, um, Kate and I were a part of um, Sasha Scott's graduate research and writing class. And as part of that, you, uh, are curating, co-curating an exhibition that goes into SU Art Museum. And so that kind of uh, gave us the bug 
uh, so to speak, for um, wanting to kind of work together to create more exhibitions for the space. Um, at the same time, Kate and I were also taking a gender in the Middle Ages class. Um, and so I think uh, to start, we gravitated towards John Taylor Arms, uh, just for, as an outreach of learning about the the uh, Gothic period. I'm not sure if Kate uh, agrees, but that's kind of how it started out. Um, and then we came up as we were in the space, this idea of what if there was a show that could be more interactive and what would we want to say with that show um, was really kind of how we stumbled upon the embracing artists. Uh, and I think with that, Kate and I kind of took a deep dive into the collections at SU Art Museum and uh, looking at watercolors um, and just different interpretations and styles that we saw with, with arms. Uh, so that show kind of fell into place as we just found more and more artists that piqued our attention. I would echo that um, and I'm gonna share an image that kind of really spoke to us as we were looking, particularly for the artists who were working in watercolors and um, lithographs and others, other material mediums that we kind of let the work um, push us along that first we were looking at uh, what ARMS was doing. And for us, it was the works that were a little bit more unusual um, or really fit within his larger body of work. And then we would find works like this by Don Kingman, which kind of echoed somewhat that ARMS was doing, but it reimagined it. And so we really let the embracing artist kind of move us along the path. And then as we kind of gathered those materials and those objects, we began to see the lines kind of drawing between the two, particularly with the way technology was either embraced or rejected. Um, and even the way that the structures were kind of recreated if they were really loose and fluid with a lot of the watercolorist or with arms, they were very precise and um, very draftsman-like. Well, I think that we might not have any more questions, which I think is a successful presentation in many ways. Um, so again, I just want to thank you and um, let everyone know uh, that we have many more virtual programs coming up um, and other virtual exhibitions um, that are coming up on the pipe. So please make sure to pay attention to our website where we have them listed. Um, social media is also a great way to keep up with what the museum is doing both virtually and in person. So if you haven't subscribed um, and following our channels, do please do that. We have Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook where you can find information on these events, collections, um, and research that's being done here in the, in the facility. So thank you all and um, everyone have a good afternoon.